Thank you. And thank you especially to the FMMAs, particularly Dr. Smith and Jay Kempton for inviting Dr. Johnson and I to present our solution and results. Uh, and especially thank you to everyone that's attending this conference. Um, you've, you know, seeing transparency in healthcare come alive is great. And I know from my journey, it's been truly inspiring over the last several years to see the growth and also try and put some of these uh, solutions in play. Does, does everybody remember this guy? Hannibal Lecter? <laughs> Hannibal, I mean, what, what a great character. Unless, of course, he was uh, interested in you as his next meal. Hannibal kind of reminds me of how the current healthcare system devours its prey, the employers and their employees. And my company was in its grasp. I've, I've got a problem. My, I've been a healthcare provider for nearly 40 years. I started with a small clinic and now have 24 clinics and over 450 employees. And health benefits, specifically BUCA-based insured, BUCA insured plans, were continuing to rise at a rate that was eroding our profits. Not unlike what you've heard from speakers uh, this morning. I, I was experiencing that. We were growing as a company, serving our community, and truly having fun, but our success was being eaten away by rising premiums. Now, my employees are a relatively young, healthy group of physical therapists. We're real active, and I couldn't understand. So I inquired of my broker at the time. I said, you know, what, what are some options for these rising premiums? Their options? Well, do nothing. And I said, well, I've, I've seen how that works the last 10 years with double digit increases. And I said, that doesn't seem to be a great solution. Um, how about raising the deductibles or, you know, some of these other things and pass the burden on to your employees? And we know that, you know, that burden has been shouldered by the employees over the last 10 years. And that didn't seem like a great option or my favorite, um, eliminate some benefits. I'm like, these are their options. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. My employees weren't happy, and I certainly wasn't happy. And I was no closer to solving the situation, and I still had a problem. So I went to the insurance world. I actually met a Health Rosetta advisor, and he very much helped educate me on the insurance world and insurance system. Our company had now grown, and so we moved from a fully insured plan to a level funded plan. We went from a BUCA TPA to an unbundled plan and put in reference-based pricing. We controlled our fixed costs. But guess what? I still had a problem. Instead of benefits really helping my employees, they were actually causing more pain. Unbundling alone didn't lower our healthcare costs. When I fixed the insurance equation, that helped a little bit but our medical costs continued to spike and continue to show no signs of slowing down. I need to understand what was really driving the variable costs part of my plan. Now, I'm an entrepreneur and a business guy, um, and this is my company's future at stake, so I, this is personal. <laughs> I, I take this very seriously, and I'd come to a fork in the road where I really need to make a decision and come up with a strategy, one that was viable and sustainable over time. And I don't think I'm alone. I think a lot of employ employers, CEOs are like me, are facing this very decision today. So my broker and I dove into claims detail. And I'm a little bit weird, but I looked at every claim, line item by line item, in my company for the last three years. Which, if you've done this, is truly enlightening and frightening at the same time. Um, but what did the data show me? Well, one thing was evident. My employees did not have primary care. So they had resorted to urgent care and emergency rooms for their health care needs for themselves and their families. They were entering the medical system at one of the most expensive options. Um, what else? Let's take a deeper look at it. So here's where my costs were. Hospitalization, pharma, you know, I'd learned that you know, untreated uh, musculoskeletal um, pain, especially is one of the leading causes of opioid pandemic, if you will, because since we've been in that, but we don't seem to be getting out of it. Um, imaging, emergency and urgent care, cancer, elective surgeries, metabolic disease, and musculoskeletal. 
These were the main drivers of my variable cost, probably not unlike most plants. I now had the data, but I was still no closer to a solution. I still, had, I still had the problem, and I don't have a good strategy. As I just stated, my, my employees were entering the system at the, the medical system at the most expensive options. I, I knew what I wanted as CEO. I wanted a solution that would address the fundamental costs of healthcare and take care of my employees. I mean, how hard can that be? When I first met CEO uh, Spooner, um, he had done a lot to work on his plan. And he had uh, a self-insured plan, he was unbundled, he'd moved away from all the major carriers. But one thing was the same, he was still having his employees access the sick care system in the same way. So, <laughs> there you are. Um, so the, the uh, employees were still accessing the sick care system by going to a, a, a system, a clinic, a urgent care or an emergency room that in most cases was owned by the, uh, the big player in town, Hannibal Health. So Hannibal Health is a hospital sick care company that owns much of the primary care in our, in our town. And so when one of T CEO Spooner's employees um, had a healthcare issue, they would first, of course, put off doing anything about it because they didn't know how much it was gonna cost and they didn't have somebody that they trusted to go to. But when it became a big enough problem that they had to do something about it, then they ended up in Hannibal Health in either one of their urgent cares or clinics or the emergency room. And I was able to share with CEO Spooner a story that, that happened to me when I was still in the old system. I was working for one of these big hospital systems and an executive came to talk to us and said, your clinic is doing amazing. You guys almost broke even last year. And I said, how could that be amazing? How could almost breaking even be an amazing result? And he said, oh yeah, all of our primary care clinics lose at least 10%. And so the next question of course is, why would Hannibal Health be buying up all of the primary care clinics in our town if they were planning on losing money on all of these? And so I'm not a cynic, but, <laughs> but if I was, I might wonder if they were buying up all of these clinics because of the goodness of their heart or if maybe it had to do something with controlling the distribution channels. So, but since I'm not a cynic, I won't, uh, I won't uh, postulate on that, but I will make one bold statement. And uh, I'm welcome to anybody who wants to correct me on this after. My statement about this is that if you are buying up a whole sector of an industry, planning to lose money on it, if you're planning to lose money on primary care, then you are probably not in the business of primary care. If you're planning to lose money on preventive medicine, then you're probably not in the business of preventive medicine. So where do they make their money? Of course, it's in the hospital. So when CEO Spooner's employees uh, went to interface with the sick care system, they found themselves at a facility owned by a company that only made money when his employees got sicker, when we failed to prevent disease, when the problem became bigger, and so we needed expensive and dangerous intervention. So this was a common problem among companies and we were able to drill down into his data and I shared with him some of the, some of the studies that have been done on other primary care organizations and how they reduce some of these costs. 
There's 59% reduction in ER visits, 37% reduction in prescription drugs, 54% reduction in overall costs, and some other data suggests that around 40% of referrals are just unnecessary. They just didn't need to happen. And so uh, we estimated that we could reduce Spooner Physical Therapy's metabolic disease costs by over 30%, which would well pay for what we do, as well as yield some savings back to the plan. And we would do this by breaking barriers down. Now, here's the patient, here's the doctor, there's a wall between them, and that wall needs to be broken down. So patients now can call ARC Family Health, the direct primary care provider, for any of their needs without any copay. They can come in as many times as they need to, same day, next day for urgent needs. They can call us, uh, have a video appointment or phone appointments, and email us, all with no surprise costs and no copays. And bringing down this barrier really brings the patient and the provider together. And uh, we didn't force anybody to fire their previous primary care provider. We just did it so much better that most of his employees have now uh, engaged with us and, uh, and consider us their primary care. So I was confident that we could do a, a really good job on the metabolic disease. That was our wheelhouse. And, um, but we partnered with another group and I want to introduce you to our third speaker here today. This is Tim with Proactive MSD, and he's gonna tell us about uh, the musculoskeletal program that went hand in hand with direct primary care. So first question is why MSK? And there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reasons for it, but there, there's also a lot of research on it. Uh, a recent JAMA article in 2020 and data that's been put out by Aon and Optum that shows that MSK is your number one cost in your healthcare spend. When you start adding up the office visits and the surgeries and the pharma and the imaging and all the unnecessary things that are done, it's your number one cost in the health spend. But it's also the number one cost in your workman's comp. It's 60 to 70% of the total spend. And it's the number one cost, or excuse me, it's the number one reason for disability. So how could it be possible that MSK is your number one expense? It's one word and that's volume. See, if MSKs were a medical problem, they'd have been solved by now. Medicine makes a lot of advances, but in this area, you know, we, we understand that pain and discomfort can really change with activity. And if movement makes the pain better or worse, then it may have a biomechanical origin. And if it has a biomechanical origin, shouldn't we evaluate it on a functional basis to try and resolve the issue at heart? In other words, if you're using the medical system, you're going to be treating symptoms. You have pain, here's some pain meds. But you didn't get to the root biomechanical cause of what caused that pain. You're just treating symptoms. Proactive MSD is a joint venture with Solve Global. Um, our mission is very simple. We empower companies to protect their people, their performance, and their profits by by, ta by tackling their number one health spend, musculoskeletal disorders. I'll use musculoskeletal disorders and MSKs interchangeably. Um, to me, they're synonymous. We employ a global solution and technology to detect MSKs at their source and deploy resources to a company's employees who are at their greatest risk. Our results are backed by over 12 plus years of data and have been certified by the Validation Institute. Let's take a deeper look at musculoskeletal disorders. You know, as I just stated a few minutes ago, most MSK injuries start out as functional issues before they become medical ones. The late Creighton Christensen spoke and wrote, wrote about the 80-20 rule. And his research showed that only 20% of employees actually care about their health at any one time. The other 80% only care when they're sick. And what does this mean for MSK? Well, there's more research that show that 54% of your employees have an MSK issue at any one time. 75% are going to have one on an annual basis. So 
the risk for the employer is very real. So our solution seeks to identify that risk in the entire employee population, track it over time, and provide prompt MSK uh, care at that point. We detect the MSK issues early, provide intervention, and address the root biomechanical causes. Many of these conditions, when they're, when they're, when they're detected early, can be reversed um, and resolved at that time. And even chronic conditions been, can be kept at bay for, from get, or from getting worse. So what is the effect of our solution? Our employees, or excuse me, our employees and our employers get the right care, the right time, with the right provider for the right value. So Proactive MSD completed a comfort and performance survey on Mr. Spooner's uh, employees. Now, I know he said earlier that he's got a young, healthy population, um, obviously not him, but uh, when, when, we, when we looked at his, well, we, we, so we surveyed everybody. Um, now we have the data. And although they had a relatively young demo, they actually had a higher than normal incidence of MSKs, and many of them were chronic, chronic issues. And they were getting worse because of the financial and uh, you know, re, uh, insurance restrictions that didn't allow them to seek care. Um, so this was affecting their employees both at work and at leisure you know, in our data. So we, started, we detected it, now we start to intervene and look at those with greatest risk. Um, and we did this mostly before they hit the medical system. So again, we provide the right care, the right time with the right provider and that's a primary care MSK provider. By tackling these employees and their MSK symptoms, we prevented a lot of unnecessary, wasteful overspending, including imaging, pharma, and unnecessary procedures that previously had been driving up their variable, variable costs. So what's a successful health plan look like? How, how do you lower risk for, for the employer? Um, how, do you, how do you take care of their entire population. Not just the people that are gonna go have surgeries, but their entire population. So we put our two solutions together in a unified solution for the, for the employer. ARC and Proactive MSD are the primary care solution for Spooner PT. We're the first line of defense. And our communication is very high fidelity and our actions are based on data. Every employee and plan member has real full-time access to their primary care needs. And all of this at zero cost to the employee. Our employees think, think it's pretty cool um, and they access us first and we help them control their variables costs, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Do you have any uh, examples maybe you'd like to share with the group that uh, <laughs> how this has worked out? I do, my, my favorite one happened on a Saturday. I was coaching my five-year-old soccer team, and right after the game, I got a phone call from one of uh, Mr. Spooner's employees. And uh, this was a young lady, 22-year-old, previously healthy, who had real bad pain in the side. And after evaluation, it seemed likely that she had a kidney stone. Now, uh, some of you probably have looked at the numbers of how kidney stones are, are treated, where they're treated, and it's pretty much always in the emergency room. But why is it the emergency room that we're treating kidney stones? Is it because they need us to do something for them emergently? Is it something that they have to have an intervention for emergently? Well, they do need to have a CT scan done pretty quickly so we can figure out what's going on with their kidney and with the size of the stone. And it turns out that uh, I was able to make a couple of phone calls and get her into a CT scan within a half an hour, probably faster than she could have done in an emergency room. And we found with the CT scan that she had a stone of about four millimeters which does not need any kind of emergent intervention. She didn't need a lithotripsy or a surgery or anything like that. She just needed medication to help her pass the stone and to feel comfortable while she was doing it. So 
We took care of that medication. She passed the stone with no further difficulty and never ended up in a hospital or treated in any other clinic for this problem. And the total cost of this for Mr. Spooner's plan was $215. That was $200 for a CT scan. That's right, only $200 for a CT scan and $15 for the medication. The patient's out-of-pocket costs were only $15. She just had to pay her copay on the medication. So this is as opposed to whether if she would have had this done in an emergency room, whereas her copay would have been at least $500, and then she would have had you know, other costs for medication, yeah. et cetera. Follow-up with the specialist would be likely because once you get into Hannibal Health, it's hard to get away. <laughs> And, <laughs> it's going to eat you alive. Yeah. So, um, so the average ER charges for a similar condition would be somewhere around 3,437. That's if, if it did not lead to any unnecessary intervention, which in my opinion, it, it likely would have. Another favorite example of mine is uh, a woman with a spot on her arm. She had a brown spot on her arm and she was not already engaged with uh, with Arc Family Health. So she went to see Hannibal Health and uh, she saw a PA at Hannibal Health who referred her to a Hannibal Health dermatologist and that Hannibal Health dermatologist referred her to a Hannibal Health uh, a plastic surgeon and he said, hey, this needs to be taken care of as quickly as possible. Let's get you on the schedule for next Wednesday at the Hannibal Health Hospital for surgery. And um, so she said, okay, yeah, let's, let's take care of this. And then as she left, she started to wonder how much this was going to cost her out of pocket. She contacted her health plan, which told her that her out of pocket costs were going to start at somewhere around $10,000 because Hannibal Health's facility fee started at $30,000. Now that's just what it started at. They weren't able to give any other estimation at, at the total cost of how much the surgery was gonna cost. Um, so I said, well, let me, let me make a couple of phone calls if you are open to alternatives. And the interesting thing was she said, oh, well, the Hannibal Health surgeon told me that he was the only person in the state qualified to do this surgery. And I said, oh, well, that's very interesting. Let me just, let me just verify that. So um, I called a couple of my favorite der dermatologists who referred me to a Dr. Jacobson, who they said was just the best at doing this type of procedure, better than anybody else they knew, including the guy who apparently was the only one in the state <laughs> who could do it. And um, so I called Dr. Jacobson's office and I asked how much it would cost for him to perform this surgery. And um, though, though I found out that he usually charges $2,000, when he understood what kind of a plan we had, he said, that will be $5,000, which sounded pretty good compared to, you know, the, the questionable cost that we didn't know how much it was going to cost. Um, and then he said that the uh, surgical center would be $1,200 and the anesthesiologist would be $1,000. So count it up, you got $7,200 to perform this surgery. He was probably more qualified than anybody else to do it. And when I called the patient back, she said, sure, I'll talk to him and see if I feel comfortable switching over. She talked to him, she said, oh, I feel much more comfortable with that guy than the first guy. And her out-of-pocket costs went to zero. From starting at 10,000, it went down to zero. And the, uh, the plan, of course, was going to start at $30,000 and their cost now has gone down to $7,200. So we have, we have hundreds of examples of things like this, whether it's a chest pain workup that includes a uh, EKG that costs nothing to the employer, um, meeting somebody on a Saturday night for a strep test uh, for their five-year-old, um, doing stitches on a, you know, a Wednesday at 8 p.m. Those are all things 
that just happen on a, on a regular basis when you have realigned the incentives and made it possible for us to do the kind of care that, that really should be done in the first place. Yep. The right care, right provider, right time. Um, one, one example of something that um, we don't have a complete solution to on our own is back pain. Um, low back pain is a very common thing that comes into the clinic. And one of the problems that we run into is that the right thing for a patient to do when they have back pain is to get physical therapy and, and other musculoskeletal conservative management. And in the old system, the, the most likely next step in back pain that wasn't responding was to go to a specialist at Hannibal Health, which is a slippery slide to a back surgery at Hannibal Health which is a slippery slide to another back surgery <laughs> at Hannibal Health. Um, and so uh, it's been a pleasure to have a partnership with Proactive MSD to help us better manage these conditions. Can you tell us a little bit about how? Yeah, I mean, I mean everyone, everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, but low back pain is the number one MSK reason that people go to the doctor, and second only behind upper, upper respiratory infections, why someone goes to the doctor every year. And low back gets blamed for a lot of stuff that aren't his, that, that aren't his fault. Um, and and, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's important to understand that when you're identifying the root biomechanical cause. Um, what does proactive do? Well, we provide treatment. You know, we, we, we go and address, you know, we can, we can address the pain. If it's in an acute situation or the chronic pain, and we can do things to help the pain. Um, we can assess their work or their workstation. We can look for the biomechanical reason of why that back is taking the brunt of uh, um, the, the forces going through the body. It's not uncommon for in today's age where someone gets a new hip, and they walk out of the ER and they feel so much better, but they haven't regained the entire function of that hip, the ability for that ground reaction forces to be absorbed. And so after a while, they just start you know, developing a, a bad limp and they come into us with low back pain. And you're like, well, you don't have any hip strength or hip function. When did that surgery happen? And could have been, could have been just recently. So we can do all of these things uh, it, with proactive with the employees um, and, and take care of all of those different issues. Um, not only do we take care of low back pain, but we'll take care of their sitting warriors too, who are sitting there with, you know, neck and uh, shoulder and hand in, hand injuries. So there's a lot of different things we can do. Uh, the people, you know, the young athletic uh, population that are out running and having calf and Achilles injuries. Yep. We got that covered as well. So there's a lot of MSK issues that we take care of for Spooner that, um, you know, can range from post-concussive, vertigo, um, BPV, BPPV um, type symptoms, pelvic health, post uh, breast cancer and breast reconstruction surgeries, um, all under the auspice of an MSK issue that now don't have to hit the medical system and we've got them taken care of. Now, in my normal, I still have an insurance side of the practice and a normal insurance side, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for us to get a prescription for acute low back pain. Um, and then upon evaluation and talking to the patient, I find out that he hurt himself, you know, in Christmas moving the ladder, setting up Christmas lights. And I'm going, uh, that's, that's not acute anymore. Um, and, you know, so they're, not only has that person suffered, that patient, that employee suffered, um, but it's now five months down the road. They're still uncomfortable. Um, they're pretty frustrated with the medical system. And now they've developed additional compensatory things that are gonna take longer to unwind. It's gonna cost more time and more money um, to, to do that. And during that time, Mother Nature's done her thing, or what we call physiological healing, is already taken place. And we, we've could, that person could have been out of the system you know, much easier if we had done that. So as primary care MSK providers, that's, we really like the proactive side because we get to see these things upstream in an acute phase 
um, the, the communication is great because we get to um, be much, you know, our results are much more effective that way. What, what does success look like in, on your side? <laughs> well, the, the most important thing for me and the reason that we got into this in the per first place is to try and do care that made sense for the patient. We wanted to actually help our patients. Um, and we, many of us in this room and many of us at the conference were kind of called out this morning uh, by uh, Brian Klepper um, to produce data. And we're gonna take that challenge. In fact, we have some really, really impressive data from the last two years from CEO Spooner's plan. Um, he'll share some of that with us in a moment. But I did wanna make a comment first about um, the real measure of success. We also learned today about value. And value, as we learned, was not measured just in lowering healthcare costs. We've done that. Yep. Um, somewhere to the tune of 69% decrease in claims. But value is a subjective term. And when CEO Spooner decided he was going to take a risk and put in a primary care solution that he believed would take better care of his employees, he didn't do it because I had proven to him that we could lower his costs. He did it because he cared about his people and it was a higher value to him to provide a higher level of care. But what does success look like from your standpoint, yeah, CEO it, Spooner? It's interesting you bring that story up because uh, if I remember correctly, uh, we made that decision in June of 2020 during the middle of COVID. And when we heard Bryce talk this morning about when making decisions in the, in the heat of the moment, uh, that, was, that was one of those roll the dice things when COVID and you didn't know you're gonna be around in six months. Um, so what's our strategy look like? Uh, this side might be, might be a hint and you already kind of hinted at it. It's, it's been pretty successful. We increased our primary care for both medical and functional issues. We actually tripled our visits to primary care and we had over 4,000 PT interactions with Spooner employees. This was an investment in our employees' health and well-being. And oddly enough, that increase in utilization in primary care led to lower claims. Our per member per month, as uh, Dr. Johnson just stated, is down over 67% from the previous year. Our net plan costs after paying for all this was down over 30%. And today our net plan costs sit at about 2.53 p.m. p.m. We still had employees have can get cancer. We still had elective surgeries, um, but we tackled and took care of the entire population. So when we did that with primary care solutions, it allowed us to really focus and hone in on, make sure that those other things didn't get lost in the Hannibal Health System. So our solution, you know, provided the right care at the right time with the right provider, but it didn't provide just the right value, it provided the best value. And we know that because we're data driven that we, we've already, we look at the data on a quarterly basis and say, what's next? What's our next strategy of what we're going to tackle next? And there's still, there's still lots of areas for improvement and I expect this number to even go, go, go down. Uh, my employees are happy, that's, that's, that's key. Uh, my employees are present. And this was really, really key during, during COVID. Um, when the ERs were closed, people still got MSK issues and still were in pain. Where are they going to go? Well, guess what? We're open for business. Let's, uh, let's have them come on in. Um, it's, it's really helped our recruiting during this challenging time for those of you who are having fun uh, trying to find employees. And we got savings. For zero dollars to our employees, they have access to their primary care needs. Um, oh, and there's two... Uh, yeah, two other things that were kind of cool. Um, we took those savings and we dropped our deductible from 3,000 to 500 this, this, this current plan year. And my employees really appreciated that. Um, and, he, and you're kind of alluding to this, one of the even, even cooler things I think is that employee benefits went from being one of our lowest rated items to now one of our, hot, one of our top, which is really cool. And you know, behind, Behind the numbers though, as, as Dr. Johnson said, is kind of the real success story. And, and this, 
for me as a CEO is really, really important. And that, that is I have a sustainable and viable solution where the central core focus of each entity, Arc Family Health for our medical DPC, wherever that guy went, proactive MSD for our functional DPC, um, and Spooner is really the same. And that is we take care of the individual, which is my employee, which is super cool. So um, it's our last slide and we'll take some questions, but you know these solutions don't do any good unless we do something about them. And we've changed. Our company's changed. We've done a tremendous amount of uh, internal and, and external education on it. Um, and everybody has benefited from these turnkey solutions that we put in place. So, you know, let's, uh, let's put it in play. So, thank you, and uh, if anybody has any questions, we'd, uh, we'd love to take them. On the back, white shirt. That's you. We, we, we know of, of other companies that have a musculoskeletal component in their, in their program, yeah. but we don't know of any other companies that have a full primary care metabolic solution partnered with a standalone specialist in musculoskeletal primary care. Yeah, what we normally see is, you know, there's you know, people will put a PT on site or an athletic trainer or someone to, to address musculoskeletal needs and that improves access. Um, um, and it can even get some savings uh, because there's access. But again, go back to that 80-20 rule, only 20% of the people are gonna care about that and actually go. Your risk as an employer is that other 80%. And that's what we found in our data, which was quite frankly shocking to me that I had a higher than greater MSK than what we've normally studied in the population. And so in order to achieve the greatest savings, we, we had to put in a primary care solution that is very data driven. Our data works upstream, if you will. Um, you know, and, 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 and what we do is we tackle those things very early on before they hit the medical system. And in, you know, more, uh, we, we don't have a tremendous amount of workman's comp but in the employers that we work with, that workman's comp thing just comes right off the top. We, we keep them from becoming a recordable um, by providing first aid, which is a tremendous amount of activity that we can do within a, with an employee. Yeah. I had a question, just a comment. Uh, my hat goes off to you, CEO of Spooner, for educating your employees. Because so often I see employers try and do the right thing and try and implement plan design and try and try and try, and then they just fail to educate, and the employees still don't understand their benefit design. So congratulations. Thank, thank you. I mean, it, it's it's one of the things we've seen, and we have a again a turnkey system where we we literally give the letter to the to the CEO. We give the next piece of thing to the HR. We provide the video that goes out to the employees. We go on site and and give them all the information. Um, but if it's not supported top down, whew, man, it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work real well. And I've seen things unravel or just take longer to, um, to, to, to gain the trust of the employees. So um, knowing that we'd already experienced that in, in our outside clients, when it came internally, I thought, well, this would be easy. We're all healthcare providers. It was almost worse. <laughs> you know, I mean, because they, again, they had all the preconceived notions. And it, maybe not my employee, but their spouse. You know, and, and so uh, we, Dr. Johnson's done a, done a great job of providing different videos and different things to, you can call us, we'll take care of your kid. And it's actually been a, a big safety net and feeder because my employee may have seen them, but now the kid has an earache at nine o'clock and they call and boom, boom, gets taken care of. And they're like, oh, that was kind of neat. You know, so. Yeah, we just need to get one or two interactions before they start shifting all their care over to us. Yeah, so it, it, education is a, is a key thing. If I, if I can just piggyback on this for just a moment. You, 
you identified what I believe is the most important part of this entire conference. When, when we were talking about putting this talk together, the reason we decided to have three different characters here is because I wanted to show that the CEO is the hero in this story. I mean, if you think about the opportunity to transform healthcare, the, the people who, many of the people who are attending this conference who have something to sell are not the heroes. We are a guide, a potential guide that can be used for the hero of the story to do something heroic for their company, to make healthcare better for their employees. And uh, so I wanted to make it clear that it, it, was, it was the CEO who took a risk. In my opinion, it wasn't a huge risk. Um, <laughs> June of COVID, buddy, it was a risk. <laughs> I didn't have any patients in the clinic. <laughs> I didn't know what I was gonna pay in August. I didn't tell you that, but. <laughs> So in my opinion, our plan year started July 1st. So when I say June, it's like we started July 1st. <laughs> in my opinion, it was a it was a secure bet in the um, in the idea of investing in the health of your people, yeah. and um, and it was a bet. It was an investment. It was like. He, he almost formed a new venture, which was taking control of his, of his health plan. Yep. And that is exactly the message that we would like all of us to be taking to the employers out there, is that they are the hero, they are the potential protagonist in this story of, of reforming healthcare, of changing healthcare for the better. When you think about it, it's a, Roughly 100 bucks PEPM for that employer to get this covered. I mean, it's, it's not, it, it, it seems like a lot, um, but there's still savings. Is that the, is that the proactive cost alone, or is that? <laughs> Both. The, com yeah. the combined uh, cost of, of our two programs comes in at roughly 100. Yep. Any other comments out there? Over here on the left. I love the where you use the guide. I love the story uh, story brand. Donald Miller. I don't know if you heard. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that okay? Um, and what I do, I am a guide. I guide Latinos to uh, elective surgeries, paying wholesale and um, very culturally um, sensitive. And I was just listening to your model and with the data that you have. I mean, what is Latino health? employees transformation looks like? How do you cater to that segment of your employees who are Spanish dominant? I'd love to hear that. Uh, well, I mean, we're, I don't know if you heard, but we're in Phoenix, Arizona. So, I mean, we've got, I mean, it's now, I think 45% of the population in Arizona is Hispanic. So uh, my workforce is probably almost a quarter. Um, the challenge is that, you know, the we, we need more medical speaking or Spanish speaking medical professionals, but once we, and we're in several um, lower socioeconomic areas where worker bees will be, which had, tends to be a lot of uh, that population. And once you take care of one, they just, they bring the house, they bring the block. And, and so to us, it, it, that, that's just a normal course of of doing business. Um, I'll just tell you just as a quick side note, I, I started a subscription model. And, uh, and I'm thinking subscription for PT, who does that? Um, you know, weirdos. And, and um, I thought it was gonna be, you know, in our more affluent areas of Phoenix that would get uptake. But the people that work for cash know the value of cash and they're buying it, which is super cool because they come in and they gotta go to work, you know, and they gotta, they gotta do things. So it's cool to see the uptake because I have it in all 24 of our clinics. We'll be training some Latino Sherpas to take to Arizona then. Love all it, right. love it. Guys. Sounds good. Let's Will, see, one have, minute left. There's one more, do you have a question, Will, or? Oh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, one over here, and uh, I think that'll be the last question. You, you want me to run? <laughs> I, will, I, will. I thought you were going to throw it. Toss it this way. Hi, guys. Uh, Hi. 
Uh, my name is Jeremy Atkinson. I'm with the Kimpton Group Administrators. Um, I totally agree that the top-down approach is so essential in making sure that employees utilize these services. I was just wondering, have you seen other strategies that help employees know about their services and want to take advantage of them, specifically employee testimonials? Um, if that's been an effective strategy where it's like an employee is talking to other employees that this has been so beneficial for me and um, you need to get on board with this. Is, is that an effective strategy? Have you seen that? Yeah, I, I was at a, a meeting at Spooner headquarters recently and um, and I, I wasn't sure who in the room had been. Is that the one I walked in? You had, you didn't know anyone? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure Welcome who in the room, room had been, uh, had been into our clinic and seen our providers. And so I, you know, kind of introduced what, who we were and, and, uh, and we started hearing the testimonials pop up, uh, from the people in the room. And, um, you know, people say, well, I love Dr. Jeremy. He helped me with this. But, uh, but that one meeting and the, and the testimonials that spread through the room were really um, an indication also of the way that it has spread throughout the company. Right. In our first few months, we still had people going to urgent cares. We still had you know, a fair amount of, of utilization of the old system. And it was really by employee telling employee about their experiences that, that it improved. But we can harness that better by capturing those testimonials and disseminating. Yeah, I, I think it's key not to, to look for one panacea. It, it is not. It is, uh, someone mentioned this earlier, it's guerrilla warfare. It is day by day. Um, every every uh, HR note that we send out, we'll have a, little, have a little hint in there. We'll have HR benefits that highlight something that ARC's doing or the proactive's doing. We, we continue to highlight these and then by the providers themselves providing the care and gaining the trust, you get that water cooler effect um, that transfers, you know, uh, across the company. And then you just keep asking questions. You know, did did you have did you have a good experience? Um, and when they have good experiences, we we try and highlight those. And it's it is there's no one letter from the CEO that's going to do that. My email campaign to my own employees has a, I think, a less than 40% open rate. <laughs> I mean, you get it, it's that's reality. So you've got to have multiple, multiple ways to connect with your staff. Um, and if that's administering a message on a strategy or our benefit plan, you, you just it's just what you it's reality. It's what you have to do. Thank you, Fort Worth. It's been a great crowd.